Hello everyone! I was prompted to do this video following a trip that Savannah and I took to a taxidermy museum near us that promotes creationism. Thus, I want to talk today about what separates creation museums from actual museums. So, let's jump right in. The local taxidermy museum that Savannah and I visited is known as the Touchstone Wildlife and Art Museum, and while it hosts a nice selection of animal skins, it also has a wall dedicated to spreading young earth creationism. Now this isn't a huge shock, after all, I live in Louisiana and have seen quite a few billboards and people handing out pamphlets that support creationism. Savannah and I even attended a rock and mineral convention where a creationist was hawking books on the subject, such as The New Answers Book 1. So, what separates creation museums from actual museums? For starters, creation museums teach that the Bible is wholly accurate in all its claims regarding history and science. Inherently, there's nothing wrong with teaching about the Bible in a museum. It's been a huge part of Western civilization that has shaped beliefs as well as countries. However, there is danger in teaching that it's infallible because it stalls progress in both of the aforementioned subjects. We must remember that the Bible is a library of Near Eastern texts, and so it must be evaluated with this fact in mind. These texts were written in a pre-scientific world. We now have a number of different, independent methods for evaluating the reliability of biblical stories. As we saw in my video, Theists Respond to My Flood Question and my debate with Kent Hovind, there is no evidence that a global flood ravaged the face of the earth. Similarly, the Genesis creation account shares many similarities with other Middle Eastern creation myths, deliberately so, as it was partially polemic against said creation myths, which themselves told that the Mesopotamian pantheon were responsible for creating the cosmos together. The intention of the authors of Genesis was to stress that the Hebrew god, the only god, did it by himself, unlike the Mesopotamian or Egyptian gods who needed help from one another. You get the point. These stories were not originally written as scientific descriptions of past events, but to show that the Mesopotamian, Egyptian, etc. gods were limited in power, attributes, and essentially pathetic beings who depended on each other. While the biblical authors were by no means stupid, they worked with what they had. Science was not even a thing back then. Modern young earth creationists have interpreted these stories to have been real events with real consequences. This brings us back to the Touchstone Wildlife and Art Museum. This museum hands out pamphlets titled God's Plan of the Ages that goes through the events of the Bible as though all of them were written as actually having happened, which of course stands in contrast to what modern scientific and historical studies tell us about the ancient world. The museum also depicts the Bible's narrative as a mural that makes some completely wrong claims about evolution as well. First, one of the pictures says, Creation is a fact, we see it everywhere. Problematically for the museum, we don't see creation, especially the young earth variety, and even if the earth were created, it wouldn't conflict with evolution, which we see various different lines of scientific evidence for. I made a playlist for some, indicating that life forms have evolved over many generations. While science has no say on the supernatural, evolution is demonstrable. I've also made a series of videos documenting in the technical literature the step-by-step -step evolution of different groups of organisms. A second picture says, evolution is a theory, not a proven fact. There are a few problems with this statement. First, theories never become facts. A theory in science is, as I showed in the scientific method, the highest form a scientific concept can reach. A fact is a point of data that is not in dispute. Therefore, theories are made of facts and the explanations for those facts. Second, evolution is as close to a fact as anything gets in science. The concept that all life on Earth shares common ancestry is overwhelmingly supported in the technical literature. Third, nothing in science is ever proved. Proof is a mathematical and philosophic concept, but not a scientific one. The validity of a scientific theory is proportional to how much evidence supports it, but only a single piece of evidence is needed to refute a theory. And a third picture says, Charles Darwin advanced the theory of evolution, but he denied the belief before his death. This isn't a simple misunderstanding of science or history, this is a tall tale that was invented by Elizabeth Cotton, 
also known as Lady Hope. She claimed in 1915 to have visited Darwin several months before his death back in 1882 while he was sick in bed reading the Bible. The problem is that he wasn't sick in bed several months before his death and no one in Darwin's family had ever seen Lady Hope at their house. No one in Darwin's family, not even his religious wife Emma, gave any validity to the Hope story. Hope's story is so full of holes that even Answers in Genesis has shot it down. The worst part of this story is that even according to Hope, Darwin didn't deny his theory, so the museum is relying on a misunderstanding of an anecdote. As an agnostic, Darwin himself said, quote, It seems to me absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and an evolutionist. Close quote. So, believing that the Bible is infallible leads one to develop some certainly fallible beliefs. In addition to creationist organizations maintaining that the Bible is infallible, they assert that it's similarly unquestionable. That's why they post statements of faith ordering their adherents to reject out of hand any evidence that contradicts their narrative. As pointed out in other videos, Answers in Genesis says, quote, By definition, no apparent, perceived, or claimed evidence in any field, including history and chronology, can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. Of primary importance is the fact that evidence is always subject to interpretation by fallible people who do not possess all information. Close quote. Creation Ministries International echoes this, saying, quote, Facts are always subject to interpretation by fallible people who do not possess all information. By definition, therefore, no interpretation of facts in any field, including history and chronology, can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. Close quote. This is a bit ironic since, even if we consider the Bible as factual in its entirety, this statement entails that the scriptural record itself would also be subject to interpretation by fallible people who do not possess all information. Remember that even creationists don't interpret everything the Bible says as literal, but even a literal interpretation is still an interpretation. By making such a statement, these creationists have rejected the objectivity for all forms of human inquiry, including science, biblical hermeneutics, and thus even their own particular interpretation of scripture, which is not concluded based on objective facts, but presupposed to be an errant a priori. This is the complete antithesis of the scientific method, wherein all answers for any questions, called hypotheses, must be potentially falsifiable and put to the test. The evidence is followed wherever it leads, regardless whether it leads to something that we rather don't want to believe or whether it contradicts our dearly held beliefs. And even if we come to a well-supported answer, which is dubbed a scientific theory, we don't regard any of it as absolute truth, since all scientific propositions, from plate tectonics to quantum mechanics, are open to change in light of new data. Borrowing the words of Carl Sagan, quote, To be accepted, new ideas must survive the most rigorous standards of evidence and scrutiny. All assumptions must be critically examined. Arguments from authority are worthless. Whatever is inconsistent with the facts, no matter how fond of it we are, must be discarded or revised, close quote. This is why you will not see any sort of presuppositionalism that creationists provoke in any scientific journals, such as Nature or the Journal of Human Evolution, nor secular museums such as the Smithsonian National Museum or the American Museum of Natural History. On the other hand, people working at either the AIG Creation Museum or the Ark Encounter must swear to the company's statement of faith. Even the recently constructed Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. aims, quote, to bring to life the living word of God, to tell its compelling story of preservation, and to inspire confidence in the absolute authority and reliability of the Bible, close quote. If that wasn't stomach-turning enough, the museum has also paid $3 million in settlements to the U.S. Justice Department for illegally smuggling Iraqi artifacts into the country. On a somewhat humorous note, five of their 16 alleged Dead Sea Scrolls turned out to be complete forgeries. In my video, Did Humans Coexist with Dinosaurs?, I pointed out that the Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum misapplied a radiometric analysis to dinosaur bones merely so that they could try to spin a narrative that non-avian dinosaurs lived recently. So what does this tell us? It tells us that creationist museums aren't interested in learning about reality because it contradicts their beliefs, and that creation museums will do whatever it takes to spread their ill-informed beliefs. 
It also means they end up being really bad scientists and historians. They are museums of error, not truth. For any young Earth creationists watching, I put up links to theistic and apologetic channels such as Sentinel Apologetics, Science Enthusiast, Wayne Fillmore, and Inspiring Philosophy who all accept evolution as most believers do, address creationist arguments, and generally do not see a conflict with their faith or the wonders of science. I also put links to YouTube videos and books by respected Bible scholars such as John Walton and Michael Heiser who thoroughly point out that Genesis was not making scientific statements in its creation narrative nor the flood narrative. So. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.